Um, and if you do wait for a startup to do it for you, instead of getting thousands of experiments, you're just going to get tens. Right? There can only be so many venture finance or even ICO finance startups. Um, whereas you should be able to just sort of run an experiment in a day. So that's kind of the ethos that motivated my behavior. I sort of felt like a lot of the tooling for um, Ethereum was too professionally oriented. Um, we really kind of needed to be, uh, especially JavaScript, Node-ish, web developer, in order to just do anything meaningful on the blockchain, unless somebody built a good UX, right? Unless there's a app, and somebody built a new website, and you learn how to use MetaMask or something like that. Um, but if you want to do something different, if you want to do something on your own, um, I felt like there needed to be straightforward, usable ways for not the mythical end user, not some person who just wants to be a consumer, um, who wants a user experience like Facebook or Google or something, but not for the professional developer, for somebody in between, people we used to call hobbyists, people who just, you know, are willing to go through some moderate learning curve, don't need everything handed to them on a spoon, but don't want to become professional web developers to be able to interact with um, the Ethereum blockchain in particular, which is the one that I'm most involved in, um, with sophistication and fluidity. Um, and so that's the motivation for this project. I really think that people should be making a lot more smart contracts than they are outside of professional contexts, outside of smart startups. Um, I was just telling Melanie, I think, that I'm going to make a piggy bank for my kid. Right? That'd be like 20 minutes of work. It's not a hard smart contract to write, but for a variety of reasons, I want to do it. I don't need to wait for there to be a startup to do it. I can just do it. Right? There's lots of little ideas like this, things that you can do, um, that you can just do, and I really wish that we had thousands of people just trying these little things out rather than hundreds of startups with teams and funding going to conferences all over the world in a world that's largely entirely aloof to where the rest of us live. Um, so the blockchain is a dApp. I don't think we have to wait around. I think we can do lots of little experiments right now with the blockchain, and um, that's the ethos behind the tooling that I've been building. Um, it's not going to be something that a non-technical person can work with. You've got to be able to get to a command line, feel reasonably comfortable interacting on the terminal, but you don't have to be a programmer um, to use this tool. So let's get to the tooling. What does SVT Ethereum? It's a text-based application. It's not exactly formally a command line ap application because sort of formal Unix being a command line application is something that runs on the shell with switches. It's an interactive text environment um, that can be used to interact with smart contracts that are already on the Ethereum blockchain very straightforwardly. It can be used to develop and deploy your own smart contracts. Um, if you are a programmer, it can also be used to write programmatic tests and to integrate smart contracts in a very high performance way with Scala applications. I'm a Scala developer. Um, and so if you are a Scala developer, it is also a framework, a set of libraries and a framework for integrating Ethereum smart contracts um, in Scala applications, or Ethereum compatible smart contracts, any of the Ethereum knockoff APIs too, um, in a very sophisticated and high performance way. Um, it's also recently, to my surprise, in my own professional life, I've discovered that you could use it as a platform for building um, custom, bespoke kind of command line interfaces, textual interfaces for um, smart contract based applications, right? So rather than just interacting generically with a smart contract, you could build on top of SPT Ethereum to make more user friendly text based interactive user interfaces to smart contracts or smart contract related applications. Um, so that's what it is. Um, how does it work? And I'll show you. I mean, it's sort of stupid to talk through stuff while you're going to show them. But let me 
talk for a little bit. SPT Ethereum is different from most environments largely because it is extremely, extremely stable. Meaning, when you download SPT Ethereum on your computer the first time, it knows almost nothing. It's just got a few hard-coded defaults that later might not work for you. Um, but it quietly, in some secret place, or not so secret place, sets up for you an internal database, an embedded database. And every time you run it, it's always interacting with that database. That database for now is technically global. Um, so as you work with it, it becomes easier and easier to work with it and work with things that you typically work with. So the first thing you need to set up typically is a node URL, right? You're going to interact with the blockchain. You typically need some node in the blockchain that you're going to interact with that's going to publish a service. An Ethereum-style blockchain publishes a JSON RPC API, and it's got a URL. So if you don't know anything about this stuff, you can go to Ethereum and get a URL that you can hit for free. SPT Ethereum has a hard-coded URL that is a node that I maintain, which will probably work for you for now, but no guarantees that it will work forever. Um, but it keeps track of that. It's also a wallet, so if you're going to interact with a blockchain, you're going to need addresses and private keys and stuff like that. Um, so SPT Ethereum will generate wallets for you, generate addresses, um, ask you for passphrases, maintain the private keys in the standard encrypted JSON format associated with Ethereum addresses for you. So every time you open up SPT on your computer, you'll see all the addresses that you've ever made before. Um, and importantly, SPT Ethereum very strongly encourages you to give those addresses aliases. Um, so it's very user unfriendly to paste um, 40 character text strings as addresses every time you need to interact with an address. We have ENS to help with that if you want to go and pay for a name and find an address to that. It's kind of a big deal. It's a lot of work. Um, so SPT Ethereum, pretty much any time it sets up an address for you or encounters an address, asks you now whether you want to give it a name to some user-friendly name that you're going to use to interact with. Um, and again, as you use SPT Ethereum over time, it becomes easier and easier because you get this library of the things you can interact with and you don't have to remember the addresses, you have the names or the database. Um, similarly, every time SPT Ethereum encounters an API, you never have to paste in an API or anything like that. Well, you do have to do it once. Um, SPT Ethereum has to encounter the API, which means either if it's a contract that you develop and deploy yourself, that's cool, it goes by default generated the API itself. So if you, every time you deploy a contract, it remembers the address to which you deployed it, um, and it remembers the API associated with that address. Um, otherwise, if there's some contract that you want to interact with, if you can say find an API on Etherscan, you can import it into SPT Ethereum, just import it to the address, paste in the API, and SPT Ethereum will remember it forevermore, whatever you're trying to interact with that address it'll know that's the API for that address. If you set up an Etherscan API key, you don't even have to do the pasting in. If the API is on Etherscan, and you set up an Etherscan API key for it, an API key, um, you can just say you want to import the API for an address, and it'll download it from Etherscan with no further work. Um, and again, the essential thing about this is you only ever do this stuff once. You're building a library of how you use Ethereum. Um, and as the Ethereum is keeping a database of everything it's ever encountered, once you've got the API, you never need to do it again. Um, when you compile a smart contract and deploy it, um, if you guys have ever done that, you know that it generates a lot of different artifacts. It generates the bytecode of the contract itself, or the deployment instructions of the contract itself. It generates the API, which is essential for interacting with the contract. It keeps track of the um, compiler version and whether it was optimizing and how many runs because that stuff's essential if somebody else wants to verify from the source code um, that the bytecode on the blockchain actually maps to certain source code so they can trust that if they're going to interact with that smart contract it does what you say it's doing, not something else. Um, so if you verify the smart contract on Etherscan, you encounter that you need all of this information. Etherscan needs to be able to reproduce the entire
compilation experience and get precisely the same bytecode, or else they won't verify the contract. You could be scamming somebody. Um, so it becomes very important that you always have that compilation information. So every time that you compile and deploy a smart contract in SPT Ethereum, all of the compilation information is, um, is recorded in the database, including the source code, including the API, including the compiler version, everything you might possibly need, including the AST, the tooling, which you probably don't need. It's all recorded there. So it's extremely stateful. It keeps track of a whole world for you over time. You do want to back up its state if you use it, right? Because it's building this world for you. Some parts of that world are potentially high stakes for you. The, the wallets, the addresses, you might have value associated with them. You don't want to lose those wallet files. That would be really bad. Um, but it makes it easy for you to back up its internal database and its wallet files and all that stuff. Um, it's a very stable wallet. Oh. What I've done. I think it got the first system out. Um, yeah, there's something here, so we'll, we'll just keep it up. And um, you'll, you'll have to save it twice uh, again. So, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, let's see if I can bring Um, so SPK Ethereum is friendly, sort of. Right? So when I show it to you, it's not that friendly. It's a command line-ish application. It's kind of weird. Um, but within the scope of command line-ish applications, there's a lot that's kind of quietly friendly. Like if you show it to your non-technical friend, they will say it looks like gobbledygook, like programmer stuff. So it's not so friendly. But if you play around in technical things, you know there's a big difference between something that's really easy to learn and something where you have to learn a lot of obscure switches and stuff in order to interact with the text-based application. In that sense, SPT Ethereum is super friendly. Um, it is designed extensively around the notion of tab completion. So you can tab complete the hell out of it and it will give you lots of clues about what's coming next. Um, for lots of the commands, they're interactive. I mean, you ask SPT Ethereum to do something and then we'll just ask you a series of questions. If you want to do it this way, you want to do it that way. Um, rather than you're having to remember a lot of switches or something like that. The names are incredibly long, so that's something that looks really unfriendly, like commands or things like e contract, ABI, print, pretty. Like, nobody wants to type stuff like that. Like, it sounds kind of terrible, but again, that's the trick of tab completing, right? That's, um, you don't have to type very much to get there, you just hit tab between a few letters. The sort of user experience um, theory behind its names are kind of gopher in a box, if you guys remember gopher, hierarchical menus. So a name like E contract GBI print pretty. E is a top level menu, everything you might want to do related to Ethereum. Contract is a sub menu, a bunch of commands associated with contracts. ABI is a sub-menu, commands for manipulating ABIs, and then print is the verb that's finally the, the command for print pretty. Um, so there is a method to the madness. They're very long names, but they're hierarchically organized where you start with E and then go to narrow and narrow topics, and they're easy to type because you're just hitting one letter and then tab all the time. Sometimes the names um, are a little bit weird. They're weird because I'm trying really hard to avoid letter collisions. I want to be able to type E capital C tab and not have two different things that begin with the letter C. So, you know, I can't have in the same submenu look up and list, even though that might sound right. So look up becomes check, stuff like that. So the names are a little bit weird. Um, but um, they're very descriptive. You can tell what they do from the names. Um, and they're easy to type because of the tab completion. Um, and they tend to be really consistent, right? So um, they're, they're kind of um, 
themes or light motifs and how SPT theory is organized. It keeps this internal database for you of things that you like to do. It maintains a lot of defaults for you. So you have a default address from which you are sending or interacting with the blockchain. You have a default node ID, all these kinds of things um, that you set as defaults and in the commands are listed as defaults. And then it has a notion of an override, which is a per session override. So you always have defaults, but if you say you want to send from a different address, instead of doing your default address, you can do each address override and put in a different address, and then your sender is that different address. Um, and then for all of these variables that you can set up, they all have commands that are set out in print. Um, so you can see what it is in print, you can set a value or you can drop a value from your database. Um, so there are tons of commands. There are more than, I think there are like 130 commands now. There are, there are lots of commands in Ethereum. Um, but you can get started with a pretty small subset. Right? So again, you can see these names are long. And it's a little bit annoying. When I started out, it wasn't like this. It was like, you know, ETH balance, and ETH send, simple names. But the problem is, is as it grew more sophisticated, I was hitting these, you know, naming conflicts. Um, so I organized it into a hierarchy. Um, so fundamentally, these commands are the ones that you need to get started just to interact with other, with existing contracts on the blockchain. You need contract API import. You give it an address. The address can be literally X. It can be an alias, because as the theory encourages you to set up, set up user-friendly aliases. Or it can be an ENS name, something .p. Um, you say import. You paste in the API, or if you set it up with either scan, it download it itself from either scan. Um, and then it knows about that contract. Um, then if you want to um, access the contract, if you want to read from the contract, if you guys have done any kind of Ethereum interaction before, you might have encountered that in Ethereum there's a pretty sharp distinction between accessing the blockchain to read from it and accessing the blockchain to modify it. So when you want to read from the blockchain, you send a transaction, but it's kind of a fake transaction. It doesn't get stored on the blockchain. You send a transaction asking to call a function that, say, reveals the value of a variable, how much money is in this account, or whatever, how much money is in this game, or if it's a smart contract, how many people are participating in this contract, whatever it is. Um, you send a transaction, but it doesn't get stored on the blockchain. You're just trying to see what's there. It's read-only. That's what each transaction view is. So you type each transaction view, you give it the address, and then you're going to need arguments to the functions that you're calling. When you're reading the blockchain, you're just going to get tab to see those arguments. We'll do that in a minute. Um, when you want to modify the blockchain, you want to use each transaction invoke. That calls a function with a real transaction. It's going to ask you to unlock a private key. That's going to require you to have a funded Ethereum account. Um, and it's going to run a transaction on the blockchain. Other than the difference between view and invoke, you use them the same way. You give it the address of the smart contract whose ABI is known to you, and then you start hitting tab to figure out what arguments you need to type in. Um, to fund an account, you're going to need transaction ether send. Again, sort of a long, stupid name, but it was originally each transaction send, and then, then I needed each transaction sign. So here we go, each transaction ether send. Um, just sends to an address. Um, you have to supply a validation. Not that off the slide. Um, and ETH address balance. If you just type ETH address balance, you'll see how much ETH you have in your account, in your default account. If you supply an address, you'll get the balance for that address. And then ETH address alias set to set short and convenient names. This is like the first start of the Ethereum kind of the subset of commands you're most likely to use. Um, Ethereum is very kind of batteries included. Every time I encounter something I need to do on the Ethereum blockchain, I don't like to use dApps, I don't like MetaMask, I don't like wallets, I like the feeling of control that comes from a text based user interface. So, you know, I buy a lot of DNS names, I don't use any of the dApps. Um, SPT Ethereum has built in support for registering, extending, looking up, creating subnodes for anything you want to do with DNS names. Um, built in commands for that. Oh, what did I just do? I think we've lost our screen thing again. We will try that again. Um, 
Ethereum also has built-in support for um, ERC20 tokens. Again, ERC20 tokens, if you guys have encountered them, they're very straightforward contracts to work with. To Your slides are. Oh. Oh, goodness. Oh, there, yeah, it's in slide trouble. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, back, back. Okay. Give me this. Um, um, it's intended to be quite hard. So it is a full smart contract development environment. You can do pretty much anything you can do in Truffle. You can do an SPT Ethereum. It's very, very good about um, FD-155 chain ID. So if you interact with different chains, whether that's Ethereum and test chains, or whether you like to use POA network or any of the other networks that support Ethereum API. Um, SPT Ethereum scopes all of the information that it stores statefully by chain ID. So if you set up a bunch of aliases to addresses on the Ethereum chain, main chain, when you switch to POA network, those aliases go away because those addresses don't have the same meaning anymore. Um, you can switch between things very fluidly and maintain a whole separate state for each chain that you interact with. Um, the uh, SPT Ethereum does all of its signing with the chain ID embedded, so you don't have to worry about replay attacks across chains. Um, SPT Ethereum supports a bunch of commands for offline um, transaction generation and signing. So for me, how I keep cold wallets is I keep a laptop off the network with SPT Ethereum, um, and I generate transactions um, on the network because it's easier to generate transactions on the network because you can look up things like gas prices and stuff like that. Um, generate the transactions unsigned on the network, stick them on a thumb, thumb drive, ask SPT Ethereum offline to sign them with offline wallets, um, bring them back, um, and execute the transactions. So SPT Ethereum supports cold wallets in a not horribly inconvenient way. Cold wallets are always inconvenient, but not horribly inconvenient. Um, full control over gas announces in a pretty sophisticated way. Um, by default, you don't have to know anything about gas announces to interact with smart contracts. That's one of the things that Ethereum tries to hide from new users. You just call a function on a contract, SPT Ethereum figures out a reasonable gas price for you, figures out what the next nonce is supposed to be and does its thing, but sometimes you want to say override transactions you've already submitted with a previous nonce, you want control over it, you can set the nonce, sometimes you want to have detailed control over how you're setting the gas. You can do that. Um, sometimes you want to use an ABI on a contract that is not the ABI that was automatically associated with it. So for example, if you're interacting 
with contracts that are defined as proxies, which is a way that people set things up in order to be able to upgrade contracts. The native API of the proxy won't be the right API that we want to use for a contract. So SPP Ethereum lets you store APIs associated with names, not just associated with Ethereum addresses, and lets you arbitrarily at any point override the API associated with an address with a named API. Um, so you can attach any API to any address that you want, and then you can start interacting with the contract using tab completion that it generates from that API. Um, so that's okay, the programming stuff I think I'm going to kind of go through really quickly. That's because I doubt very many of you are Scala programmers, um, but it does generate within Scala a Solidity like embedded DSL. It's extremely type safe. Um, event handling conforms to the Java standard reactive streams interface. So there are publishers that will generate events for you and publish them to a Java standard reactive, as a Java standard reactive publisher. The events, Solidity events get converted into type safe events. Um, every event that you declare becomes a class in Scala. You can, um, you can define listeners for the event, publishers for the events that don't use filters. If you guys have encountered this stuff, if you are an Ethereum developer, you know that the Ethereum APIs have subscriptions for events but you can't reliably use them if you're using services like Impura, um, because it turns out that stateful filters are very expensive to manage at scale. Um, so at the key Ethereum, stubs publish events statelessly from the service perspective, meaning the uh, stubs themselves manage the state, you're not using the filter methods that work on Impura or anything else. Um, you can listen for events in real time, you can query for events, you can collect events by type, um, and you get type safe objects. If you're not a programmer, that doesn't mean anything to you. If you're a certain kind of programmer, if you're a skeletal programmer, you like things to be very type safe, and it's exciting. Um, this is just an example of a contract I'm working with now. It's sort of a simple kind of proof of existence contract. Um, and this is just me showing sort of skeletal code for interacting with it. Build a stub to it, you need to know its address, you need to know who you're talking to. Um, you need a sender. Um, the easiest way you can generate a sender is from a private key, although there are other ways to generate senders as well. Um, and then you can just start calling methods on the stub. The methods are segregated by either views or transactions. Are you calling a method to read, to look something up? Then you say docs.view and call the size method. Um, or if you want to actually change something, you want to store something, then it's not store dot TXN for transaction. And you call the store method. Like, always when you're interacting with a theory smart contract, you're either interacting in read mode or you're interacting in send transaction mode. Um, the stubs can be synchronous or asynchronous as you like. If you are doing a high performance application where you need to be careful about not wasting your threads, you want to call things asynchronously. Um, so that you always get a future, and when your transactions are mined, then eventually you'll get a notification that your thing is done. Um, you can do it both ways as the Ethereum. This is an example of interacting with an event. Every, this doc app store publishes a bunch of events, and you can see you can just pattern match on the event types to do the right thing. This is an example of basically a web UI that wants to track the state of a smart contract, so when somebody changes something on the smart contract, it sits around and waits for events and it you know, varies its caches so that it knows the next time somebody goes to the website it's going to actually look that up and kind of fill in the cache. Um, so that's it. So now the fun part of the demo. Um, the first thing to show you is this. This is your entree to SBT Ethereum. It's sbt-ethereum.io. SBT um, as you can see, you know, I told you there are like all 130 commands or something now that are all in these sort of hierarchical menus. It's kind of a hierarchical way of going through things. Um, but we're going to start. There's a tutorial called Getting Started. And I'm going to walk you through that kind of really quickly because um, it takes like two minutes to get started. And I want to do that. So let's do that. Um, I'm actually going to start by doing something a little bit weird, which is 
since SBT Ethereum is very stateful, it would be cheating for me to bring up one of my normal terminals because I have all kinds of crap in there already. Um, so what I want to do is I want to make a new user. So now I have a brand new user, and I'm going to put this down. Um, so So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to become that user. Okay, and go into its home directory. So now you can see this is a kind of a fresh Mac user. There's nothing in here. The only thing that I really needed on a Mac to have is I needed to have the JVM installed. Okay, so there's a JVM install. Formerly in my docs, I'd say you need a Java 8 JVM install because that's what this stuff's been most tested on, but I think it's going to be fine on a Java 11 JVM. We're going to leave that alone for now. Um, and to get started, the funny thing about SPT Ethereum is you don't actually really download SPT Ethereum. SPT Ethereum will download itself. SPT, SPT is a build tool. So what you need is a folder, which is your repository of stuff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to download, and the easiest way to download it is by cloning, so we're copy this command. We're going to download um, this kind of dummy repository called git command line. There we have it. Um, and then if we look inside of the command line, see it's got a bunch of stuff, among which is this thing called svtw. Now, if you already have SBT downloaded on your machine, you don't need to worry about that SBTW. You just type SBT to get started. But if you don't have SBT on your machine, and if it's a Unix machine, Linux or Mac OS, you can just run this wrapper script and it'll download it for you. Um, right? So we didn't download SBT Ethereum. It's doing that right now. Um, it's going to take some time. Hopefully, it won't take too much time. Takes a minute, but I think this that syntax error thing is the job of 11 issue that is up here. Let's see. Okay, now we are getting things. I need to um, hum elevator music. Okay, well, I should enter things up here for us. Oops. There we go. I don't know why it's going to be so long pause before I download this stuff. Okay, so here we're at where SPT Ethereum is really starting you out. It tries to hold your hand. So there's all that crap that it prints. Um, but at the very bottom, it starts asking you questions. So SPT Ethereum is quite interactive. Since 
we randomly created a new user. This new user has, doesn't have any state associated with it yet. So there's, there are no wallets in your SPT Ethereum key store. So it knows that you can't really do a lot without wallets and addresses on Ethereum and says, would you like to generate one? The answer to that is yes. Okay, so it generated, there's an address for you, that long ugly address. Um, and I need to give it a path phrase. Okay, there's a wallet. Um, now SBK Ethereum likes to have associated a default sender for every in its state. It wants when you run SBK Ethereum to have some address, which by default, if you start doing a transaction, you're doing it from that address. You can override it whenever you feel like it with some default address. So since this is the only address we have, we're going to let it be our default sender. Um, so the default sender automatically gets an alias called default sender, whatever one you set up as default. It's default sender. You can give it other aliases too. Um, it notices we don't have the Solidity compiler installed. Do we want one? We say yes. Um, it installs it, so it keeps its own secret place depending on what platform the appropriate place where applications leave their state. Um, and it installs compiler right in there, so you never see it. Um, so we've installed a compiler, we've got an address, and here we are. Um, so what can we do? Well, if we want to interact with a smart contract, that's an easy thing to do. We're going to need an EBI. So I'm going to continue with the little tutorials, so it's easy for something to do for you guys to do at home. Um, there is a kind of stupid little application that I have made here. You can actually see the source code to this exciting application if you want to. It's a fortune cookie or magic meatball style application. So you can see you construct it, you give it a fortune, you can add fortunes to it, you can count the fortunes, the fortune array is public, so you can see any fortune that you want by index, and you can draw a fortune, which uses a shitty source of randomness that you should never use for high stakes financial applications, but which is fine for non high stakes financial applications, which is it uses the effect of randomness in fire black black ashes. Um, so this is the fortune application. And so in order to interact with the fortune application, we're going to need to have its ABI. Right? That's, the, that's always sort of the stopping point. You can't do anything without an ABI in Ethereum. But we can say deep contract ABI import. And then we do that. Now it's warning us life would be easier if we had gone to Etherscan and ask them for an API key and then it could download the stuff itself. But we haven't done that yet. We don't feel like doing that. We can just go to Etherscan and plug in this address, which is verified. And we can go down here and steal this API. Paste it in there. Um, and there it is. Now, SPT Ethereum is asking us what it usually does when it encounters address. It says, you don't want to type in 0x82EA8EB1EA36272322F376A5F71D58348716A8F1 a lot. <laughs> Let's give it a name. Um, so now, we can do each transaction view. So we're doing a read-only thing. Now I need to, so I type tab. I, I kind of just type that out, which is stupid. But if I do E and then T and type tab, it knows that's got to be transaction. If I type tab, tab again, I can see all the transaction-related commands. Right? So the reason for this repair of structure of commands is I can get as far as I know, and then I can get a list of commands. And the command that I want to read something from the contract is a transaction view. Okay, and then I hit tab, and it tells me I need an address, right? So I can put in an address hex, I can put in some ENS name, um, but it also knows about two addresses in its local database of aliases. We want to use fortune, okay? And then I hit tab, and these are all the methods of that smart contract. Well, they're not all the methods of that smart contract. Let's look at that. Here's the smart contract, and if you look, 
we saw draw fortune and count fortunes, and we also saw fortunes, but we didn't see add fortune. The reason is because those methods, fortunes is just a public variable, count fortunes and draw fortunes are methods mark view. They're methods that are for reading. You don't have to change any state of the blockchain. Right? So each transaction view knows that. And so when you hit tab, it shows you all of the non-modifying methods. All the smart contract that lets you select one. So let's do draw fortune. So exciting. Then I can hit tab to see arguments. I'm trying to see what the next argument to this function would be. And it says invalid input. Right? Well, that's its way of saying if you look at the function draw fortune, it doesn't take any arguments. Right? So why would we supply it? So now I can just hit Enter. And look at that. There's our fortune. Love the humans, everybody. Run the clock. <laughs> but, um, so it's, it warns you of something here, which is to say, if you download this, if you do this at home, you can do everything that I've done right here at home, very easy and simply. Um, you are secretly and quietly using, as your Ethereum node, a hard-coded um, address, we face an RPC, mchange.com, mchange.com is me. It's just a node I maintain. Um, and that's fine. I'm happy for you to use it because I want you guys to start using SPT Ethereum. I don't want to be its only user anymore. Um, but, um, you know, over time, in theory, I might play or whatever. You can set up with each node URL default set. It's a long name, but once you kind of get the rhythm of it, it should make a little bit of sense. You can plug in, you know, an, a, a URL that you get from Mercura or any other service or your own node if you run your node. If you set it as the default, the defaults are what live in your persistent database. You will set it once and you will never have to do it again. It will always know it. It will always be the URL associated with mainnet. Right? By default, when you start up SPT Ethereum, your current chain ID is one for mainnet. Right? right now, we're not worrying about it. We're just using its hardware default, which works fine. Now, if we wanted to actually change the blockchain, we would do each transaction invoke. And if we do that, you see, oh, we still need to tell it that we want fortune. Um, and you see that we um, have the same function that we had before. We can call all the functions that we want to call for the transaction, but we have another function called add fortune. Um, so we can do add fortune. And then if we hit tab, it tells us what argument it needs. Right? So for add fortune, just typing add fortune wouldn't be enough. Right? There's add fortune, but add fortune needs a string. It needs an argument. Um, so by typing tab, I saw I need a fortune of type string. Strings used to require the double quoted strings, but now, just recently, SPT Ethereum support single quoted strings or opaque strings even without quotes, but let's do a double quoted string. Um, okay, does anyone want to hazard a guess? Is this going to work? Yes or no? What is the, what do you call it? The signature. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, so it's gonna, I'm gonna hit this and it's gonna tell us that, right? So it says unlocking address this thing. Where did this one one see? I'm not gonna read the whole um, 40 characters again. Where did that address come from? On chain with ID one aliases default sender, right? So usually when SPT Ethereum prints an address for you, it does it in this very reverse way. It tells you that on or on chain with ID1, it has a sale as default sender. So that address, it always is going to use the sender associated with a session. And it always has a sender associated with a session unless you've literally never set one up. Um, so usually that's a sender, that sender is a default sender, which we set up when we started it out, but we can replace it, right? If you have an Ethereum address that's funded that you want to use as your sender, you can just do ETH address sender default set and then give it your new address, and that will become the default sender associated with, um, which will be associated with sessions by default. If you have an address you want to use just now, that's not your default sender that you don't use all the time, but for some application you want to use a certain address, 
there, there's each address sender override address, and then that becomes the sender for the session. Right? So it knows the address. Once it knows the address, if you're trying to set a transaction, if you're trying to call a transaction, it's going to look in its key store to see whether or not there's a wallet associated with that address. There is, and so it can ask for the passphrase. If there is no wallet associated with the address, you can still access it, but if there's no wallet associated with the address where it asks for the passphrase or hex private key, you have to give the hex private key. Right? So it's much better to import your wallets into SBT Ethereum because you don't want to ever really see private keys. You want to see them as little as possible. You want them to be plain text as little as possible. So if you already have JSON wallet, you can import them directly into SBT Ethereum. Um, it is ETH key store from JSON import. It's a command. Um, if you go and you just have a private key, you can import it once, give it a passcode, and then it'll be maintained encrypted and only unlocked like this when it asks to type in the passcode. So we can type in the passcode. Okay, so it found that. Now, SBT Ethereum is very cautious and terrified of people getting screwed because of software that I wrote. I'm still terrified that I don't pretend that I have resolved all security bugs or anything like that, but I want to give you a lot of information, right? So this is a transaction that it's sending, tells you the address that it's sending to, the address that it's sending from, it shows you the actual data it's sending. We're not sending along any money with this transaction, it's saying. It shows you, since it has the API around, it shows you that we're calling the add fortune function with the first argument, fortune, a string, if I feel like people are watching me. Tell me what the nonce of the transaction would be. This is the first transaction from this address, so if nonce is zero. And then it tells you how much the transaction would cost in gas. And if you're connected to a network, it looks it up from Coinbase to see how much that is in money, in <laughs> US dollars. Um, so, um, so now we can say yes. What's going to happen when I say yes? Does anybody know? That's going to fail. Why is it going to fail? Because you're not allowed to run transactions. You can look stuff up from the Ethereum blockchain all day long for free. But when you want to do something that modifies Ethereum blockchain, you've got to pay. You've got to pay for computation on Ethereum. Right? So let's overcome that little gap. Um, so here was the address. Uh, our sender address. And I'm going to just cheat. You know, you guys, if you're following along at home, you've got to figure out how to send money to your address, or you've got to import an address you already have that has money. I, I can't really help you too much with that. Um, but when I'm me, I can cheat, because I have funded addresses. So this is me as S. Waldman, not as test user. So I have all of my state associated with it. And I can do each transaction and ether send to this long address here. Um, and I'm going to send what, 0.01 ether, a little bit more than a block, right? Unfortunately. No. Um, so notice amounts in SPT Ethereum for amounts of ether. You can type in an amount, which can be a, it can be an integer or a, or a decimal. And then if you hit tab, you get to type in um, any of the standard units. And we're going to want that to be Before we do this, let's run the command so you can see something happen. Eat address balance. Um, our current balance is zero ether. Actually, I'm going to do something else before I really do this. I'm afraid um, the SPT Ethereum sets its gas price using the standard circuits that the, that the um, blockchain gives you for sort of a current gas price, but it tries to be economical rather than fast. And since I'm demoing in front of you guys, I don't want you to wait for too long. I want it to be fast. So I'm going to override the gas price, not with a fixed price. I am going to make it set a 100% um, markup over the default gas price, which is a lot. It's just me being nervous about being in front of an audience. 
right? But it should be it should be mine quite quickly now. So if I go back to this. So again, if you guys haven't encountered Ethereum very much, this might sound like mysterious to you. But you have to basically tell the Ethereum blockchain how much you're willing to pay for its computational services. The Ethereum blockchain gives you a default price, but if you want to be fast, you can tell it that you want to pay more. And that's what I just did. I told it I want to pay double. Um, right, it gives a little warning that there's an override set. Um, and I'm going to, this is this one. Okay, and we can see, even though I set that before I do anything, I always have the right to like look at how much am I really screwing myself, right? By paying twice what it costs, this whole thing is going to cost me a nickel of value. I think I can afford that to be a little bit less embarrassed. Okay, so now it's set the transaction to Ethereum blockchain, and we have to wait for it to be mine. And I paid all that money, a whole nickel, so I hope that it will be mine fairly quickly. More elevated music? <laughs> any, any requests besides the girl from Ipanema? Could you recognize that was a girl from Ipanema when I was elevated elevator interview? I think it's quite impressive if you can. Whenever you want to send a transaction to the Ethereum network, there is a latency. So by setting it at double the price, I'd hope that latency would be about 10 to 15 seconds because that's Ethereum blockchain. Block time, excuse me, meaning I hope that um, that it would happen within the first block. Um, apparently, my 100% markup wasn't enough for that, so we're waiting. It's probably been 20 or 30 seconds already. So we're probably two or three blocks into it. If we get frustrated, we can go and take the transaction hash. So this thing that I'm copying, every transaction gets this long string of hats. That's called a tash. Okay, there it is. It's got mine. Right, so there it is. Um, I don't know exactly how long that took. Probably about 30 or 40 seconds, three or four blocks to get mine. Um, but it gives us all the information about the transaction. Um, in this case, it's a simple transaction. No problem with that. Um, so, and we should see if we look here, where before we saw a balance of zero. Now, if I do the balance of my default tender, it's um, 0 0.01 ether as of the block, which is about $1.67. Um, it seems low. Um, anyway, so now we have a funded account. And this thing that we tried to do before, which is um, put in a fortune that I feel like people are watching me, we go through this again. Okay. Again, it's going to ask us to approve the transaction. You know what? I'm not going to submit this transaction because I don't want to keep you waiting and we're going to have the same issue, which is that if I use the default price, then we're going to have to wait a long time to get a line. So I am going to do the same thing I did before. Gas price override. And I'm not going to give it a fixed quantity. I'm going to give it a 100% markup. And we're going to do that again. So you don't have to do that if you're doing this on your own. Um, but in recent experience, the Ethereum blockchain is reporting prices that are quite low. So you have to wait a long time if you don't do that. Um, but it knows I didn't have to type the passcode a second time because I had just typed it by default. Um, I think the Ethereum hashes unlocked private keys for about five minutes. Um, so now it's asking me, it's going to cost me 38 cents to do this transaction. I'm paying twice the usual gas. I think I'm cool with that. Can I outsource elevator music? OK, yeah. well, there went. <laughs> that was relatively fast. Um, OK, and so again, you can see all of the information about the transaction, everything you might care about, including since this was a transaction on, on a contract that changed the blockchain, it's good form in Ethereum whenever you write a smart contract 
when you change the blockchain, you should log events about what you change. And this contract does that. So you get printed the raw logs, which are meaningless to humans unless you're very into very good kernel, internals. Internal. But since SPT Ethereum knew the ABI, it could interpret that event into a human readable event. So it shows you the event committed by the blockchain on that transaction, which is this fortune added event. So now, if we do each transaction view, fortune, actually, to see it, um, well, it's on the fortune contract. I need to know how many fortunes there are first. So I'm going to say count fortunes. Um, there are 28 fortunes. It's going to be the last one. So if I look inside the fortunes array, I need a key for the array. If I put 27 in, the last one, I feel like people are watching. Right? So we've added this on the blockchain. We have forever and indelibly altered the Ethereum blockchain today, people. Um, we've added a new fortune to this list. And now if people you know, run the draw fortune thing, if we do it long enough, we have a 1 in 28 expectation every 10 seconds of seeing our new fortune. Um, so that's it. So we have worked with the blockchain. We have run a transaction on the blockchain. Um, the next step I could show you would be to, let's just do this for a second. Um, we can even do it, you know, to, you know, this is a little experiment I'm working on. Um, but if you, want to start developing, I'll show you how you set up a directory. It's very easy. But once you have typed your source code in, the source code to this thing is um, okay, this is the source code. This is kind of a weird application. I can tell you about it in a minute. But anyway, this is source code I was just working on today. It's not done yet. Um, but you just type compile and it will compile the solidity for you. It's got these warnings about things that can't be deployed because there are libraries in this. If you look at the source code, again, it's very powerful. So one thing that SPT Ethereum will do for you, it knows about um, it knows about GitHub, so you can put GitHub um, URLs directly into imports and it will drag them in. So I've imported two libraries from GitHub. GitHub to apply to the library, not contract, so they can't be deployed. Um, anyway, so this does compile the contract. If I wanted to deploy it, I'm not going to because it's not done, it's not ready. I can type eat transaction deploy, hit tab, and it knows there's a contract that successfully compiled that it could deploy to the Ethereum blockchain. That would be a transaction, just like the one we just did. Um, if we did that, it would automatically know it's a PI, we wouldn't have to import it, and then we could just start doing each transaction view with each transaction vote and interacting with it directly. Um, anyway, I think that's probably enough of a demo. Um, you guys have been very patient. And my last slides are I'm very excited to support you if you are excited to try this out because I would like there to be more users of this thing. Um, so please do feel free to get in touch. Um, you have my email, Interfluidity on Twitter. Um, you can get me quite easily if you DM me on Twitter about this or something like that. Um, emails I'm slow about, but Twitter less so. Um, you can find all the information on GitHub. You can do issues on GitHub if you want. If you, if you do have um, questions, like one thing I really appreciate is if people ask questions on ethereum.stackexchange.com with the tag SPT Ethereum. So one, I'll get to them very quickly because again, I really want people to use this and it's nice for me when it, it's getting some public use. Um, and two, it's just a good, I, it generates a good history of support where other people have the same problem and wonder where to look. So I'd love it if you, um, if you post questions on ethereumstackexchange.com with the tag SPT Ethereum, I'll see it immediately and get to it really quickly. Um, feel free. Last slide is just to say that I stole an image from somebody. That's why I stole it.
So thank you so much for your time and patience. What's that? Last second?